We're going to be getting started, so I'm going to ask everyone to very kindly, as you can, uh, bring your conversations and yourselves to your seats. So we'll be starting our day. Uh, good morning. I am Seth Axelrod. I'm, in addition to co-directing the conference, I'm an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry here at Yale, and I direct the DBT services at Yale New Haven Hospital. It is such a delight uh, to have you with us for our 15th annual Borderline Personality Disorder, or BPD, conference in partnership with the National Education Alliance for Borderline Personality Disorder. Each of these 15 years, we've been proud to bring you experts in science and practice related to borderline personality disorder, as well as courageous individuals who can speak from their personal experiences of living with this disorder or caring for people who struggle with this disorder. We are equally proud to invite you, our audience, who also represent clinicians, researchers, individuals with lived borderline personality disorder experience, and family members to all join together in learning about this disorder and its treatments. Our philosophy for building our conference is that we will do our best in tackling these complex problems when working together with our collective efforts and wisdom. The focus of this year's conference is on one of the most challenging and important areas for improving the lives of many individuals who struggle with BPD, namely managing and recovering from the impact of traumatic experiences, such as having an additional diagnosis of PTSD. The relationships between BPD and PTSD are fairly complex, and we explored them in some detail at a prior conference. And you can find videos on our website for free uh, for, those, for those talks. Um, in thinking about trauma and traumatic stress, I'd like to invite us all to think a bit broadly about the kinds of experiences that individuals with BPD may experience as traumatic. This may include childhood experiences such as physical or sexual abuse, which are overrepresented in BPD, but that's definitely not universal. It can also involve adult traumatic experiences such as car accidents, crime-related trauma, sexual assault. However, I'd also invite us to consider less obvious experiences of traumatic invalidation that may also cause people to have traumatic stress responses, even if they don't fit neatly into a PTSD diagnosis. For example, individuals who are challenged with BPD features might be more strongly affected and traumatized by events that others might not experience as traumatic. On the other hand, individuals with BPD may be treated in ways that are different and traumatic due to problems of stigma with the diagnosis when they attempt to access health care. On this point, I'd like to share part of an email I received from Paula Tusiani Eng, President of, and Executive Director of Emotions Matter, who you can meet at, her exhibit, at the uh, Emotions Matter exhibitor table. Paula shares observations that match my own. She says, so many individuals with BPD report feeling traumatized by the healthcare system in emergency rooms. They are afraid to disclose their diagnosis due to stigma. And then when they do, they are often traumatized by those who don't want to treat them or make them feel worse throwing them into isolation, suicide watch, etc., without validating their emotional distress. They are traumatized by insurance companies who routinely deny their claims. Families are traumatized, but individuals are too by the experience of feeling suicidal, having repeated attempts. And when they work up the courage to get help, they sometimes experience trauma that prevents them from wanting to seek mental health care. So there's a great irony here that not only are we often failing to help individuals who struggle with traumatic experience, our own healthcare systems can actually add to or create new traumatic experiences. So in, a different, in addition to learning how to best support individuals with BPD and PTSD, it is really upon all of us working in mental health, those of us who are mental health care workers here, to use what we learn today to help educate those within our ranks to eradicate this problem and those supporting individuals with BPD to do our best to validate the traumas that they may have experienced in their efforts to receive treatment. As we discuss these very traumatic experiences, I'd like to note that if anyone attending today should feel stirred up by the presentations in ways that are not helpful for you, please feel free to take breaks for self-care. 
Also, please come to the Yale New Haven Hospital exhibitor table if you should, if you should be looking for assistance or for referral options, especially locally. I'd like to acknowledge our co-providers. National Education Alliance for Borderline Personality Disorder, Yale New Haven Psychiatric Hospital, the Yale School of Medicine Department of Psychiatry, Yale New Haven Hospital, oh, I'm going the wrong way. Um, oh, this is, uh, this is last year's. Uh, and also our, uh, still, our program's still there. Our um, YIELD program is also a co-provider, and I invite you to find us over at the Yale New Haven Hospital exhibitor table, where we, are, um, we have information about a online searchable DBT directory that we've recently um, uh, rolled out. So please see that there. Uh, this is, unfortunately, this is last year's. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave this one. I'd like to, um, this, is, this is correct though. Uh, I'd like to um, give a very big thank you to our co-sponsors, co uh, Clearview Treatment Programs, uh, who you can find here, and also uh, McLean Hospital. I'd like to invite everyone to visit all of the exhibitor tables. If I try to say them off the top of my head, I think I might miss some. Uh, but please do see them for uh, options for very high quality uh, treatment for borderline personality disorder and also some wonderful uh, advocacy uh, resources for accessing care and for supporting the needs of those with borderline personality disorder. Um, uh, a um, piece of, uh, oh, I want to give a, um, oh, and I don't have it again, I don't have it here. I apologize. We have a big, uh, I want to give a big thank you to all of the people who have made this conference possible, the people on the planning committee, my co-directors, coordinators, uh, I would say that uh, they know better than anyone that this conference would absolutely not happen without their very hard work with us. Uh, organizing things, I'd like to particularly recognize Emily Cooney, Kelly Workman, Marie-Paul de Valdivia, who took many, many um, um, <coughs> thank you, um, who, who made a lot of this happen. And I'd like to thank our whole army of volunteers uh, whose names I do not have up here, but who you will see doing all sorts of tasks throughout the day and uh, lending their hands and their time to help us. I'd also like to uh, bring your attention just to be aware that we uh, take conflicts of interest very seriously. We uh, work to resolve any potential conflicts of interest to give you a conference that is balanced, fair, uh, and consistent with science um, and identify any possibilities of uh, conflicts with commercial uh, materials, which there really aren't. Um, uh, however, some of our experts are paid for their expertise in helping deliver um, these treatments uh, to, the, to the world. All right, I'd like to next introduce our conference co-director, Perry Hoffman, president of, um, of our conference partner, NEABPD. Under Perry's guidance, NEABPD has had an incredible record of initiatives educating about BPD, advocating for BPD needs at state and federal briefings, consulting to state and federal agencies on ways to improve care, and developing programs for family members affected by BPD. Uh, Perry, I, I looked it up. Apparently 15 years is a crystal anniversary of our doing this conference together. So everyone, please help me wish Perry a very happy crystal anniversary. So good morning and welcome. And Seth, thank you for that. And now I have to turn it back to you because I also realized it was our 15th anniversary. And so made, had NEA make a plaque for you. And what it says is, um, 15 years of conferences, a perfect partnership. Thank you. Thank you. 
So again, welcome. And those of you who've been be here before have heard this story that um, about 16 years ago, there was a conference in New Orleans and Seth actually stalked me until he found me in some shopping mall and said, we need to do a conference together. And that was the beginning of the conference that's now hit its 15th anniversary. So welcome all of you who are here for the first time and welcome to all of you who are now groupies for us. And I know some people have come year after year. And each year the conference seems to get more exciting and bring in uh, more new ideas. Um, for the first conference, the attendance was high and we were always wondering would we ever match that. And it always seems that each year we match more and more. And each year we sort of think, wow, we've hit a mark and then it keeps growing and growing. So we're very pleased that this year our topic is trauma and we're pleased for it for a variety of reasons. First of all, it's a, it's a very crucial topic in the, in the BPD community, but also NEA BPD has taken a more um, a more sort of assertive stance in being in the trauma and suicide community and we're now actually partnering with some of the associations um, and suicide because we're realizing that we're overlapping communities and as much as we've been very much mired in the borderline personality disorder community and we're proud of all that we've done with them we also know that so many of our folks also belong in that other community and I'll explain to you in a, in a minute or two um, what we're doing. But today you'll hear journeys, you'll hear journeys of trauma, you'll hear it from um, actually a young woman who reached out to me, um, I guess about two months ago and said, I have a, a, an anthology and I'm publishing a book and would it be okay if I donated all the proceeds to any ABPD? and good fundraisers that we are, because we're not, um, we were, I was just thrilled and I said, can we talk? And I think within an hour, Emma and I were on the phone and now she's the presenter speaking at the conference today. We also have a mom who's gonna share her lived experience and the trauma that she has gone through um, and also recovery. And about, I guess, five years ago, I was chatting with Melanie Harnett, who's one of the presenters here today, and we were talking about the traumas that family members go through. And as a clinician, I've sat with many parents in a room, seen them actually go into PTSD in the moment just from a telephone ringing. So Melanie worked up a beautiful survey where family members responded about traumas around the BPD symptomatology. And I don't know, Melanie, if you're gonna present any, any of that data today. But um, basically what, it's, what it showed was that over 53% of family members actually meet criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder based solely on the, B, the BPD symptomatology. So we're not talking about PTSD from other life events that they had. But that began me to think, my goodness, if we have these families, and these families are in our Family Connections program, and I know Marie Paul will tell you a little bit about that, we started to think, well, we need to be doing more work with these families, because if they actually suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, what are we doing for them? So Family Connections addresses a lot of that, but more recently what we've done is we've taken our Family Connections class and course and we've adapted it and it's called Family Connections, Managing Suicidality and Trauma Recovery. And it's um, in its third pilot study, what we're doing is trying to see the way we did it with the original Family Connections was roll it out to select groups of people and do pre and post assessments. And we're just hitting our third pilot study to see if actually the modifications to Family Connections will address the needs of this part of the community. And as I said, the suicide communities are interested, so we actually had a call on Tuesday and some other things, but we hope that this will be a course that will address families of suicide attempters. Um, it's hard to believe there is no course out there for them. There's nothing. And if a family member's hospitalized, um, the parent or the spouse is called in and told to restrict the means and here's the hotline number and all of that. But just like all the other first uh, responders, we know that family members need skills as well. So that's one thing that we have underway. What also we're doing is that we um, 
have also had requests from the schools saying that we need to have family connections in the schools. So we're just going to be beginning to pilot test that in the fall. There's a district in Westchester County called the Ardsley School District that has been doing DBT for 10 years. So we've been able to partner with those DBT experts now and adapt the program where it'll be given 12 um, weeks in a semester to family members of teens. So we're very excited about that. And the last thing that we are doing, and it's a dream come true for so many of us, is our wait list for Family Connections is embarrassingly long. Just Australia alone, I can tell you there are 1,500 people waiting. And just like one of our board members says, it's unfair to tell somebody that there's treatment out there for cancer, but you can't have it yet. So what we've been very lucky to do, thanks to the Hudson Bay Foundation, and those of you who don't know who that is, that's the um, Canadian company that owns Saks Fifth Avenue and Lord & Taylor. They gave us $100,000 to kick off um, d donation to start building this online family connections. And then another uh, foundation came up with a very large sum of money. And so now we have all the money we need to get this course online. And that will be our next initiative too, to make sure that family members can come to our website, click it, and within an, an hour or two, become a member of, of the Family Connections community and learn the skills that we know have been so helpful to families. So that being said, welcome again. We hope you find the day productive. And Seth, it's just a pleasure, 15 years. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce you to another of our conference co-directors, Marie Paul de Valdivia. Uh, to welcome you and say a few words about, our family, about the Family Connections Program. Marie Paul is a former executive board member of NEA BPD who continues to deliver the, their Family Connections Program twice a year here at Yale. She contributes to BPD and family education at the university as an assistant clinical professor of social work in psychiatry. And she leads a group practice serving individuals with BPD and their families. I'm absolutely delighted to announce that beginning with our next annual conference, Marie Paul will be taking the helm as our lead conference co-director. So a big thank you to Marie Paul. I am so honored and so proud to welcome you all to um, today's conference. A few years ago, as I was working with Seth and learning my craft with him, he said something that really resonated with me. He said that we really are a community of treaters working with a community of people who struggle. And over time, I've, I've sort of kept that sentence inside of me, and over time I've sort of grown it, expanded it a little bit, to we are a community of um, people who struggle and their families and treaters who are all working as hard as we can to help one another. And we are doing the best that we can in this. So I think of this conference as sort of the yearly party we throw ourselves, because we work really hard, and we do really good work, and we have some really awesome outcomes. And it's absolutely lovely to have everybody here. Some of you are new, and the warmest of welcomes to you. And some of you come every year, and it's absolutely fantastic to have you here. As members of this community, I think many of us have a vision. You know, it's, it's really wonderful to go broad, statewide, international, and there's great value in that, to share our knowledge with one another. There is a lot of knowledge. There are a lot of people who suffer everywhere, and it's wonderful if we can help them. But there's also value in going deep. And model, and that's the hope for us, model what a local, multi-layered community has to offer. From inpatient work to absolutely outstanding um, in um, um, intensive outpatient to a connected network of treaters who value each other's help and who like and respect one another and enjoy working together. To a really solid and growing network of families who offer each other support, who have access to treatment, and offer each other support through Family Connections, the uh, signature program of NEABPD. 
Family Connections has been in this community, community nonstop for the past eight years. And we have grown through this. And many of the parents who have taken Family Connections have now grown to become leaders themselves. And many of them report absolutely wonderful experiences doing that. So this interconnected web, if you will, of help for people who struggle, for their family members, and for the treaters is really what our community is, um, is relying on. So um, I am so delighted to hear of all the, um, all the opportunities for growth that Perry talked about. Let me tell you just a little bit, complement that with a little bit about Family Connections itself. Family Connections has been around for a little while now. We do have a very long wait list for that class. It is, um, it is a class for family members only, and it offers skills, it offers support, and uh, it offers a lot of psychoeducation. So people come to Family Connections, many of them are brand new and have no idea what they're going to find. And what they find are people who have similar experiences, which is incredibly helpful to them. They also find understanding and knowledge they're able to find the compassion in their heart and curiosity about what's going on, and then they're able to find tools and change things in their families for their relatives and for themselves. The way that people join and come to Family Connections, and we're lucky, again, because we have this ongoing program here in New Haven, the wait list is a little shorter. Um, so I really encourage those of you who have families um, either as clients or in your circle who would benefit from Family Connections, send them to the NEABPD website, have them register on the Families tab, and the class is free, lasts 12 weeks or a weekend, depending on, on the class that people sign up for, and, um, and we're always totally happy to welcome them. Um, and have them. You will hear more about family connections from the mom who um, actually took a class that I co-led a few years back. So you will hear more about that. So back to our community. We work together in, diff in very different and yet complementary ways and very interconnected ways to make a very real difference. And with the wonderful support of our sponsors and our exhibitors, this is where we can share and grow, and model, and eventually expand. I hope you all enjoy this day. I hope each of you will find what you are about to hear transformative. Thank you for being here. All right, so before turning the conference over to our conference moderators, my dear friends and co-directors, Drs. Emily Cooney and Suzanne Decker, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Frank Fortunati to come up and share some opening remarks. Uh, Dr. Fortunati is Vice Chief of Psychiatry and Behavioral Health at Yale New Haven Hospital. He's Medical Director of Yale New Haven Psychiatric Hospital and an Assistant uh, Professor in our department. Thank you, Dr. Fortunati. Thank you, Th thank you uh, Seth and Emily. And and others for, for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. I want to start out, though, by being a bit provocative. How, what is DBT? Who here knows what DBT is? Raise your hand. About 16 years ago, I asked that same question at a, in a new job that I was in, I, right after training. I left Yale and became the medical director of the State Hospital for Adolescents in New Jersey with about 50 or 60 kids with repeated hospitalizations, and no one there knew what DBT was. And I, I, was, I was shocked. I was immediately started calling back here to Yale, saying, I need to come back to, to, to Yale. <laughs> and, 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 and it's uh, you know astonishing that you know, Marsha Lenahan began uh, publishing about cognitive behavioral therapy for borderline personality disorder in the late 80s. Her first manual was published in 1993, and Dr. Dr. Axelrod uh, uh, kindly mentioned to me uh, today that tomorrow is her 
Tomorrow's her birthday. I think tomorrow's her birthday, and uh, she's retiring next month. Uh, but you know, 15 years after she started publishing about this, and a full 10 years after she actually produced the manual, a, a state hospital for adolescents that's treating many kids with, with trauma. And, and while I was there, I, I did, a, did a chart review, and f about 55% of the girls that were there had documented sexual trauma. And it's just unacceptable that an innovation in, in care delivery and in innovation in treatment uh, you know, takes that long to get more widely disseminated. You know, one in five adults experience a mental illness now in any given year. One in five youth will experience a severe mental illness at some point in their life. Half the children aged 8 to 15 have received some mental health services in the prior year. Uh, at, at, uh, in Connecticut, uh, psychiatric hospitalization for what we're now referring to as transitional age youth, it's generally 18, 16, or 18 to 25, increased 9.5 percent from 2015 to 2017. At Yale New Haven alone, when we looked at our data back to, from 2013 through, through 2016, we saw a 30 percent rise in the need for psychiatric hospitalization for transitional age youth, 30 percent rise for the need of hospitalization for transitional age youth, such that we created our own a specialized unit to, to work just with uh, kids in that age group. As we all know, suicide now is the second leading cause of death in that age group. And th this is a true crisis. And in my, in my humble opinion, it's now, it's really unacceptable to accept uh, mediocre care. It's unacceptable to continue to provide just treatment at usual. At Yale New Haven, we're moving towards tr uh, trying as best as we possibly can to make sure the, there's the right patient matched to the right inpatient unit. And similarly, we're trying to match that with our outpatient programs to make sure that, that uh, folks are in the appropriate outpatient program where they're receiving the evidence-based care that matches their, their needs. We're far from there to completing it, but I'd, I'd like to think that we're better, we're closer there to it than we were a few years ago. And uh, I think across, across the delivery network nationally, we need to move towards making sure that, that everyone is receiving the, the most evidence-based care that's appropriate for them. Now, of course, everyone here knows what DBT is, and you're, you're, you're here because you're seeking further knowledge, further in, information. You want to improve your skills, and, and for the clinicians that are, at, that are here, you're, you're seeking to be at the top of your game and making sure you're providing the best care that you that you possibly can well there's many types of evidence-based therapies out there out for all different types of disorders and as a psychiatrist i'd like to think that i'm an expert with diagnosis but but by by no means am i an expert with uh, dialectical behavioral therapy of, of course not but i'd like to know that i can point folks into the right direction and make sure that they're getting the best service that they they can uh, get and and so I, I I'd like to really just challenge everyone to hold in the providers here really to hold your colleagues to a higher standard uh, to ensure that they are also delivering the best care that they can that they're keeping current that they are uh, uh, referring people appropriately and if and and that they're uh, they're not stuck in old dogmatic ways of thinking about the way that they do treatments. And I, again, we'd like to, we're going to hear a lot today about uh, advances and refinements, I, I believe, in the, in the DBT model. And I would challenge everyone to ensure that it doesn't take another 10 years or 15 years for those refinements to be more widely disseminated. With that, I'd like to thank Drs. Cooney and, and Decker and Hoffman and Axelrod for inviting me for the opening remarks. Welcome everyone to, to Yale for the conference, and I hope you enjoy your day. Thank you.
Hi, everybody. Welcome to um, the 15th of um, these wonderful conferences. So the, the particular theme for this year is um, overcoming the impact of trauma for people with borderline personality disorder. And we have a specific focus on exposure therapies um, in our round of, of expert speakers. Um, and as Frank pointed out, um, DBT is certainly one of the um, best evidence-based treatment approaches for, um, for borderline personality disorder. And um, we are very, very excited to have the developer of DBTPU here among many of our, um, our expert speakers and our speakers with lived experience. So um, just a couple of housekeeping remarks. Um, Social workers and psychologists, please be sure to sign in and sign out at the end of the day to receive CEUs. Um, and psychologists, please be sure your name is on the psychologist CE sign-in sheet. And at the end of the day, please be sure to sign the psychologist sign-out sheet and you'll receive your conference evaluation emailed through MedHub uh, before receiving your CE confirmation. Lunch is going to be on your own. Um, and we've got a number of nearby options listed in the back of your programs. And we have a little bit more time for lunch this year. So you've got an hour and 10 minutes. It may well be five because we want to make sure that our speakers have an opportunity to answer all of your questions. But you have a little bit of wiggle room. Um, and speaking of questions, we uh, would love to have your present, um, our presenters get all of your questions, and we have an army of willing and not shy volunteers. Do you want to raise your hands and, and wave to people? So shout out to all our wonderful volunteers. They are going to be marching up and down the aisles here with index cards. You jot your question down on an index card, hand it to the person, and then they run them to me, and I run them up to the presenters. And that way, we don't have any kind of pauses. It's all just seamless and beautiful. So as your question occurs to you, do jot it down. Um, so that you can get it answered. I'm sure you've got many burning questions. And then if we don't get to some of your questions during um, the time for questions at the end of each speaker's talk, we have a panel discussion um, in the afternoon where people can also respond to questions. Please make sure you write legibly. Um, we want to be sure we understand exactly what you want to know. Um, now, this week, um, and actually this month, is quite the extra extravaganza of events related to borderline personality disorder and emotion dysregulation more generally. So it's BPD Awareness Week, and um, McLean Hospital is actually offering um, another educational offering um, tomorrow. So there they are offering, if you Google McLean Hospital um, and tomorrow's date and BPD, you will read about the Global Alliance Prevention um, Conference, which has some really um, expert speakers as well, um, talking up in Waltham, Massachusetts. So if you're interested in making a weekend of it and you're not already signed up to the um, Family Connections program uh, that is happening this weekend, consider um, uh, nipping up to Boston and availing yourself of the, um, of the wonderful talks that will be there. They're still taking regist registrations. All right, so now it is my privilege to um, welcome our first speaker, Dr. Lee. Um, he completed his undergraduate training at the University of Massachusetts um, and then went on to complete postgrad training at Auburn U University uh, with Dr. Frank Weathers. He completed his pre-doctoral inter internship through VA Boston Healthcare System um, and he's currently a postdoctoral fellow at the, v at the Behavioral Science Division of the National Center for PTSD, PTSD at um, Boston VA. Come on up, um, Dr. Lee. Um, his program of research is focused on understanding the association between emotion regulation and PTSD, development and evaluation of emotion regulation and PTSD assessment instruments, and understanding mechanisms of PTSD treatment. He is going to be setting us off um, today, and I am delighted to welcome you here. Thank you so much, Danny, for, for coming.
Thank you for that introduction, and thank you to everyone for having me here today. Uh, I'm very excited to hear a wonderful series of talks, and hopefully I will try to do them justice. Um, so my name is Danny Lee. As, as was just mentioned, I'm a postdoctoral fellow at this place called the National Center for Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder at the Boston VA, which exclusively does research on advancing uh, our understanding and treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. I do not have any conflicts of interest to report. I'm supported by an NIMH training award grant. Um, as some of the work that I'll be presenting today was supported by um, several different institutions, including Auburn University uh, Dissertation Research Award and an NIMH grant to uh, my advisor, Dr. Denise Sloan, um, and we have no conflicts at all to report. So I'll start out with a bit of an outline of what I'm gonna be discussing today. Um, starting off with the biggest picture question of all, what is emotion regulation in the first place? I'm going to talk then a little bit about how emotion regulation relates to PTSD or how we think it does. And then I'll close out with some, uh, what I think are some important future directions in improving our understanding in this area. I'm going to start out by feeding some vegetables in the first place though. It is uh, a very wide, uh, very wide recognition of the importance of emotion regulation at this point. Emotion regulation has been uh, theorized to play a central role in the development, maintenance, and remission of numerous psychiatric disorders. In other words, we think this has some causal effect in generating mental health dis conditions. We also think it plays a central role in treating and reducing these conditions over time. Certainly, DBT is, is a huge player in this area. There's an emotion regulation therapy that Dr. Menon developed. Um, and we think that emotion regulation plays a huge role in, in numerous different kinds of PTSD treatment as well. However, I don't think we know what emotion regulation is. This is one of the oldest concepts in psychology. So if we go back to Freud, we think about, for example, repression trying to push away an unwanted emotional experience. This, of course, has taken many different forms over the years. We've seen this come out as coping, right? Uh, trying to help manage these unpleasant emotional experiences. Uh, there are, we see this called emotion regulation, emotion dysregulation. We see related concepts like psychological flexibility and emotional cascades and negative urgency all of which are different variants of this similar kind of idea. When we have uncomfortable emotional experiences, how do we help manage those? How do we sit with those experiences? How do we push those experiences away if we want to? How do we strive through them? So, uh, like we do in psychology. We go back to the books when we want to investigate a question. And so I started out looking at this idea by going back to what are the theoretical models of emotion regulation? In fact, there are over 16 models. There were 16 at the time when I wrote this, these slides, and believe it or not, there's been another one in that time. Um, they vary tremendously in how they define emotion. They vary dramatically in terms of whether or not they include the development of an emotion as part of their actual theoretical model. Some of them specify what we're hoping to accomplish when we regulate emotions, others don't. And they vary in terms of insight as an as a actual component of emotion regulation. I, one of the easiest way to help organize our thoughts around this is perhaps to approach the biggest divide in this entire area. That is, uh, for any fellow baseball fans out there, I'm going to start to talk about the different kind of thoughts of emotion regulation as strategies versus competencies. So strategies are akin to a pitcher thinking about what kind of pitch do I want to throw? Do I want to throw a curveball? Do I, throw, I want to throw a fastball? And lots of different emotion regulation strategies have been thought of in this way. When I experience an uncomfortable or unwanted emotional experience, what strategy do I use to help regulate that feeling or help change how I'm feeling? So we can think of acceptance, a, you know, a non-judgmental acknowledgement of how we're feeling. Maybe I want to avoid the emotion altogether or try to shut it off as quickly as I can. Maybe I think about the situation a little bit differently, you know, a little bit more op optimistically or objectively. Maybe I just want to suppress the emotions and not show at all how I'm feeling. By comparison, 
many others think about emotion regulation in a kind of competency framework. So rather than what kind of pitch I want to throw, maybe this is my ERA. This is how good a pitcher I am. How good am I at, at regulating emotion, regardless of the strategy being used? How difficult is it for me? When I have a strong emotion come up, am I able to do anything, or do I just kind of have to sit with that feeling until it naturally abates? There are numerous, numerous different frameworks, as I mentioned, over 16. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a, briefly about the two kind of most popular theoretical models. Um, so the mo one of the most famous, James Gross's process model of emotion regulation. This model defines emotion regulation as efforts to avoid when we experience an emotion in the first place, or how we impact how long an emotion persists for, or how strong it is. So this takes on emotion regulation from saying we can do things before we have an emotion to impact how we experience our emotional processes. So for example, if I know that I have social anxiety and I get an invitation to a party, I might just turn down that invitation or not respond to it in the first place. And this model con considers that a form of emotion regulation. This framework identifies several kind of pro points during the emotion generative process where we can intervene to regulate those feelings. So as I mentioned, our, our first one, situation selection, I can say I'm not going to that thing that's going to make me anxious in the first place at all. Then this goes to once a situation is occurring that's going to elicit emotion, I can modify that actual situation. So for example, if I'm a veteran and someone brings up something about combat or what did you do, do during, that, uh, during your deployment, maybe I shift the conversation away from combat or I distract somehow or fake having a phone call and need to step outside. Uh, attention deployment, then once a situation is already occurring, I shift my attention to something else. So I go into a room and play a video game for a few minutes to try to distract. Once a situation has already occurred and we've made an interpretation of that situation, we shift to kind of a, a, a cognitive change strategies. So thinking about the situation differently in order to feel differently about it. So. I can handle this situation. It's not as bad as I made it out to be. This is a common target of psychotherapy, particularly cognitive behavioral therapy, which will get folks to kind of reinterpret situations. And then finally, we have response modulation. So once an emotion is fully generated, how do I help bring this emotion down? So diaphragmatic breathing, help, trying to take big, deep breaths in order to bring down an emotion. Everything that we do once an emotion is fully activated. I'm going to, uh, in no level of sophistication adequate for any good DBT provider, provide a very brief overview of Dr. Linehan's emotion dysregulation model. Um, but to give a sense of perspective of an entirely different lens of thinking about emotion regulation in the first place, uh, Dr. Linehan has conceptualized emotion dysregulation as having heightened sensitivity to emotionally evocative cues. So for someone who struggles with emotion dysregulation, they may notice things or pick up on cues that other people that do not struggle with dysregulation recognize at all in the first place. Uh, folks with dysregulation tend to have a heightened reactivity to cues, more so than other people wouldn't. So a, a rude or offhand comment may not evoke the kind of emotional response from someone else that it may from someone with dysregulation. Difficulty modulating, so once an emotion comes up, it's harder to bring down, it takes longer to regulate. And then finally, uh, difficulty inhibiting behavior. So when someone's up to, uh, distressed and they, they feel a pull to do something kind of impulsive, it's very difficult for mo people with emotion dysregulation to inhibit that, those impulses. So this literature has received numerous uh, critiques, and I think many for good reason. There are a ton of labels in this literature that essentially discuss the exact same thing. So emotion regulation, emotion dysregulation, difficulties in emotion regulation, uh, all center around very, very, very similar concepts. Likewise, there are some labels that are identical but mean completely different things in different literatures. So for example, acceptance within the coping literature means coming to a place of acceptance in struggling with a difficult event. So for example, coming to terms or ha coming to a place of acceptance with losing a sibling. If we talk about the emotion regulation literature, that means nothing at all about coming to a place of acceptance. That means non-judgmental acknowledgement of a brief emotional experience. Wildly different meaning, completely different term, completely same term. 
many of these uh, frameworks conflate emotional responding with regulation. So for example, um, if we think that uh, how long or how intense an emotional process is for some person, we may call that dysregulated. You'll hear that a lot in clinical practice, either describing someone as, clinical, as dysregulated or, or saying that someone has difficulty regulating those emotions. It may be that how people regulate emotions are completely distinct from how strong their emotional processes are. We're really not at a place of scientific evidence for that yet. We have major definitional creep, so this is when uh, something is developed as a label and then starts to gather other related concepts under that umbrella. So for example, many people have said that uh, processes that are sometimes thought of as emotion regulation, like rumination or worry, um, are actually just products of emotional responding. They're not actually efforts to regulate those feelings. Those are just automatic processes that occur. And it's very difficult to say with any convincing evidence, no, those are really different processes. One of the things that I was most struck by when I started to work in this area is that many of the theoretical frameworks, including very, very prominent and highly cited theoretical frameworks, remain almost completely untested in any empirical format, which is really quite striking. Um, so for example, there are many uh, very similar sounding concepts within uh, emotion regulation that no one has even bothered to test. Are these actually different constructs or do we think these are actually parts of uh, one underlying concept. And I'll spend a bunch of time on that today. Emotion regulation is theorized to be different than coping and different than mood regulation. Um, if you're feeling a little skeptical about that idea, I'm with you. Um, it's very hard to think that this is a completely different process from some very similar uh, ideas. And many have argued, in fact, that this is simple repackaging of old concepts that have been around for a very long time in clinical psychology. The theorized distinction is that emotion regulation refers only to regulation of brief affective states associated with a particular stimulus. So for example, uh, a cashier is rude to me when I go into a grocery store and how I manage that irritability is emotion regulation. Mood regulation uh, refers to regulation of a longer duration affective state that's not related to a particular stimulus. So I woke up in a bad mood that day and what I do to try to brighten my mood over the full course of a day is mood regulation, not emotion regulation. And then finally, coping is regulation of a longer term affective experience related to a particularly negative event. So coping with the loss of a sibling over years, for, so to speak. Now, there are those, including uh, very prestigious researchers who argue that these are in fact distinct processes. Um, again, there's not any evidence that I know of to actually demonstrate that these are actually distinct processes. And then finally, uh, one of the things that I think is one of the most important future directions is that all of these kind of uh, issues in this research have led to unintentionally making a, a real oversimplification of our understanding of emotion regulation. Um, often folks will study one aspect of emotion regulation in isolation. So for example, how rumination relates to PTSD. Important research to be sure, but this prevents us from understanding how emotion regulation strategies interact with each other. So for example, does someone who uses a lot of rumination and not a lot of acceptance differ from someone who uses both? Um, we would expect that among these many different emotion regulation strategies, they influence each other or have some impact over time, and we actually don't understand uh, much of the interactive and time sensitive and context dependent nature of these processes. So now I'll start to dive into some of what we've been doing in this area. So if I said, asked the group here that someone is experiencing symptoms including sleep disturbance, appetite disturbance, chronic low mood and feeling very sluggish, you'd say, well, those probably aren't different things, those are probably symptoms of depression. In the exact same way, our research group and several others have started to look at emotion regulation strategies to say, are these in fact not distinct features, but do they actually represent a common underlying concept? So what we've done is we've taken numerous of these theoretically distinct emotion regulation strategies like reappraisal and social support seeking and acceptance and rumination and we've used something called um, 
confirmatory factor analysis to actually provide th empirical evidence of whether or not these represent a common underlying idea. Um, a brief aside, uh, I really enjoy statistics and ran all of the analyses on everything I present today. Given the nature of the conference, I won't be discussing those at all. Uh, <laughs> if you have questions about those, I love as much as anyone to nerd out over statistics, so I welcome your questions later on, uh, and, and, but won't talk about them in the course here today. Um, so some have thought of, in fact, this exact idea that emotion regulation strategies actually do represent one common underlying core. In fact, that emotion regulation is one cohesive idea, much like we think of as a disorder as one cohesive idea. Um, this is absent evidence. There is there's no evidence that I've ever seen, and I've been working in this area for about seven years, I've never seen ev any evidence to support this idea. Others have started to suggest, in fact, maybe there are more efficient ways to group things. So for example, uh, this is the, the good-bad framework, maybe we should organize emotion regulation strategies into the ones that we think are good for people and the ones that we think are bad for people, right? The ones that we teach people to use more in therapy and the ones that we say, you really need to cut that down, that's not helping you get better. So. Uh, this framework has been labeled as the adaptive and maladaptive framework where we include things like reappraisal and acceptance as adaptive strategies or things that we think help people get better relative to our more maladaptive strategies or things that uh, tend to be related to psychopathology. Um, so avoidance of emotional processes and experiences, rumination, expressive suppression, and medicating our emotions. Of course, we could frame things as James Gross and his theoretical model would in terms of when these strategies occur during the emotion generative process. So for example, strategies that occur before an emotion is elicited in the first place and at the different sequences as they occur during an emotion comes up. And then numerous other researchers have in fact created very elaborate frameworks for how we should organize these strategies based on what the goal is, right? Is my goal to appear calm under pressure? For example, if I'm in a military unit, I don't want to show my subordinates that I'm scared, right? Maybe that's important for me to feel calm in that situation. Perhaps the goal is the opposite. In fact, I want to allow myself to experience that emotion and gradually bring it down. Uh, those are two wildly different goals that we would expect people use different strategies for those things. So cool is one example of these, though there are many others. So both for my, for my graduate thesis and for my dissertation, we tested this exact idea. We took existing theoretical models of how to organize emotion regulation strategies and did confirmatory factor analysis to test. Do these theoretical models do a good job of organizing these strategies? Remarkably across two undergraduate and one graduate and one community samples, uh, we definitively found results very consistently telling us that in fact, none of these theoretical models do a good job of organizing how these strategies co-vary with each other or how they relate to each other. And the best or most appropriate way to treat each one of these strategies is distinct. So in other words, these strategies don't represent any underlying construct. In fact, they're completely independent. Now, my favorite example of why I don't think this is right is thought suppression and experiential avoidance. Thought suppression is trying to push unwanted memories away, and experiential avoidance is not feeling accepting of unwanted internal experiences. If there's anyone here who can tell me that how those are different, <laughs> I welcome it. Um, they correlate when we look in a correlation table of at least 0.7 or higher. In other words, one person who uses a lot of thought suppression is very, very, very experientially avoidant, and yet we can't say definitively that these reflect a common underlying process. This doesn't feel right to me, and it hasn't, he hasn't felt right to many of my collaborators either. So we're still on the hunt for how we can actually define a better or more cohesive, more parsimonious framework. All of this is to say, we tested in the last, for my dissertation, we tested 11 theoretical models each of the, some of the most popular models that are out there, and we did not find support for any of them, which is really quite remarkable. So again, going back to my introductory thought on this, I'm still not sure we know what emotion regulation is. 
There are some reasons why I think this is, uh, could be the case. One is that uh, this, this literature is very highly reliant on self-report questionnaires and surveys. Uh, surveys are imperfect in many ways, uh, but they're particularly limited in getting at very complex, abstract processes particularly among people that we think have a hard time describing how they feel, right? So if I asked you, uh, someone in the crowd, to tell me why are, you know, how distorted are your beliefs? We, we wouldn't expect very valid or meaningful results back for numerous reasons, but all of that is to say, that's probably not a great way to measure that. Likewise, if I asked you, relative to your peers, how uncomfortable are you sitting with and validating your own internal experiences, you might not have the best measurement of that. Um, so this is one area that we think this is maybe contributing to the problem is we're expecting that people are giving us highly accurate measurement of their own emotion regulation processes. I don't think we have good reason to, to think that's the case. These measures also vary considerably in how they're designed. So some specify an emotion, others don't. None of them specify a time frame. So some people tell you how they regulated emotions last week. Others tell you how they regulated emotion in childhood. Um, we tend to get a sense of how often a strategy is used from these, but we get nothing about is that strategy effective or not. And we're, we're completely relying on respondents to, t to be accurate uh, and understand each one of these strategies. So to help kind of nudge this process along, because I, I, I studied under a measurement expert in graduate school, we developed a clinician-administered measure of emotion regulation strategy use. So for any of fellow researchers out there, we did a, a, a Haynes and Kubani's construct validation framework. We did a comprehensive review of the literature. We pilot tested this. We had content area expert reviews, including Doug Menon and James Gross. Uh, we evaluated this for reading level, so anyone with an eighth grade reading level or above can read these items clearly and understand them. The resulting product we've called the semi-structured emotion regulation interview. And this is a separate measure of both how often someone uses a strategy and the effects of those strategy use during the past month. And you're able to separately identify different emotions and the intensity of different emotions. We drew on several pieces to help guide this. So we get examples of people's emotional responding during the past month. And then we only assess measure, uh, strategy use among people who endorsed using, ha experiencing that emotion during the past month, of course. We get uh, frequency ratings. So for example, if you had 10 episodes of anxiety during the past month, what percentage of those times did you use a given strategy? And we also get efficacy ratings. So for example, when you used this strategy, for example, self-medication, did it make you more anxious or less anxious? A little more anxious, a little less anxious. And what we tried to do for an, an initial first step uh, is see how much do these emotion regulation strategies vary by the type of emotion that we're looking at. So we did a couple of different quadrants for this. We looked separately at how people regulate anxiety and anger, and we looked separately at severe anger versus moderate anger. So when someone has very strong emotional responses, do they differ? We found some, what I thought was very interesting results. We found that uh, numerous, numerous important differences in how often people use different strategies. So for example, we found that people use self-medication or using a drug or alcohol to reduce an emotion much more often for anxiety than anger. So for some reason, we're, uh, people don't feel the need to use this technique to shut off a different kind of emotion. We found that people used acceptance to manage anger much more often than they did to use anxiety. So this emotion is more acceptable to some people for some reason. And then we found that people tended to engage in rumination much more often for severe extent of these emotions than they did for the milder ones. These raise as many questions as they do answers, but certainly one of these things that the, uh, one of the most important findings this draws for me is we're tapping into something here we tend to see a lot of variability in how often people use different strategies depending on the kind of emotion that they're experiencing. This is one of those, of course they do, moments that uh, you can only get at by taking this kind of deep dive. 
we also found, which I was most excited about, some real big differences based on how the impact strategies had. So for example, people found that using social support seeking, self-medication, reappraisal, and avoidance were very effective in reducing emotion intensity. So these did a good job of shutting emotion off. You can see sprinkled in there, we have some healthier and unhealthier strategies, each tending to have some similar effect on those emotions. We found that rumination enhanced emotion intensity, unsurprisingly, and we found that acceptance and expressive suppression didn't really seem to have much of an impact, but we found that this differed a lot by emotion. So for example, uh, someone who uses expressive suppression uh, for mild anxiety, we actually found this reduced it. So if I'm a little nervous and I try not to show it, it actually may bring that emotion down a little. However, if I try to use this exact same strategy for severe anger, it actually amplifies the emotion. Uh, we, we, we spent a lot of time chuckling about that finding and thinking about times when we've tried to not show how angry we were at something and the effect it had. Um, and then we found that rumination had very, very limited impact on moderate anger, but when f uh, folks ruminate on severe anxiety, this pretty dramatically amplifies the, the severity of that emotion. So in conclusion about what emotion regulation is, there's still no consensus. Uh, many of these theor theoretical models remain completely untested. Their real world applications or how these work outside the research lab remain very poorly understood. We have limited insight into how these relate to symptom change over time, and we have pretty substantial measurement challenges. So I say all this to say again, I think that emotion regulation is a critical core concept, very central to the theoretical models for numerous critical interventions like DBT and emotion regulation therapy, and perhaps others, and I still think we don't actually know what it is. So getting into trauma. So, for our exposure trained folks, I'm also going to do a poor job, a quick job of describing how we think this is, relates to exposure work. So for folks who are exposed to trauma, many tend to develop erroneous information about stimuli, responses, and their meanings. This is called emotional processing theory and it's underlying one of the most common treatments for post-traumatic stress disorder called prolonged exposure. So if, for example, I was in a car accident and I thought the roads are just too dangerous out there. I can't get back out there, it's unsafe for me to drive. I could do two things. I could get back on the horse and get right back in the car and get back out there and driving, which would provide what we call corrective information. In fact, accidents are very low base rate occurrences. I don't have to be as nervous about this as I was. I should be cautious, but I'm, I don't have to be as scared about driving as I was. And this tends to reduce fear about driving. If on the other hand, I say, nope, I can't drive to work anymore and I start taking public transit only, that tends to reinforce that erroneous information. See, I knew it wasn't safe to drive. I haven't been hurt since I started avoiding traffic. And this tends to bring on pathological fear. A close colleague of mine, Antonia Sielagowski, and I did a meta-analysis, which is a summary of research on the connection between emotion regulation and post-traumatic stress disorder. We reviewed 57 studies, all of which were cross-sectional at the time. That means that they were studied at one time point. And we examined how numerous different kinds of samples or trauma type may have impacted the association between emotion regulation and post-traumatic stress disorder. We found uh, some, I think, somewhat interesting findings. Many aspects or components of emotion regulation were pretty strongly related to PTSD. In other words, people who use these, stri these strategies more often tend to have worse PTSD symptoms, part particularly rumination, thought suppression, and experiential avoidance. We found somewhat lower effects for expressive suppression and worry, but emotion dysregulation was the strongest, had the strongest association with post-traumatic stress symptoms. These associations were not moderated, so they weren't different depending on the sample type. So for example, undergraduate versus community or military, and different trauma types didn't impact that at all. So uh, our most recent effort to do this, we've identified groups based on emotion regulation strategies. So uh, if we can identify who uses what kind of strategies, do they differ in PTSD symptoms? Our most recent input on this was a community sample. Um, 
we looked at lots of different of these questionnaires that people have developed for motion regulation strategies and measured PTSD symptoms and trauma-related functional impairment, or the degree to which trauma has had an adverse impact on their ability to work, their relationships with other people. We did something called latent profile analysis, which helps us identify groups based on lots of different things. And we found three different groups. We found essentially a group that does all the strategies we don't want them to use, a group that does the strategies we do want them to use, and a group somewhere in between. What we did then was look at what are these folks' symptoms like? And in fact, those folks who use those bad strategies, those strategies we don't want them to use, tend to have worse PTSD symptom severity, they're more likely to meet provisional diagnostic criteria for PTSD, and experience much worse trauma-related functional impairment. So perhaps that maladaptive adaptive framework doesn't do a good job of identifying how strategies group together, but maybe it does a better job of identifying groups of people based on emotion regulation strategies. Maybe this framework is better interpreted as kind of a within-person perspective. Again, I think this raises as many questions as it does answers. Uh, how stable are these groups over time? Do people kind of bounce from one group to the other? Do groups vary in terms of how much we can manipulate or change those emotion regulation strategies? And how do these apply onto everyday life? These remain very open questions. And again, cross-sectional design and questionnaires, which I think represent major limitations in this area. And I'll quickly wrap up by uh, talking about um, how we think these relate to PTSD symptoms over time. So we have very limited, there have been only a handful of longitudinal studies that have said how emotion regulation strategies relate to PTSD symptom change. One of the ones that we've done in our, our lab is understand how do changes in emotion regulation relate to changes in PTSD symptom during treatment. As I mentioned, avoidance is a, an emotion regulation strategy. It's also a major symptom cluster of PTSD. And we think that our treatments impact this component of emotion regulation differently. So our exposure-based interventions target emotion, uh, avoidance directly. We have people think about the trauma that they've been through and allow themselves to experience those emotions and those memories. Our cognitive interventions, such as cognitive processing therapy, really target the beliefs underlying these traumas. So about the causes and consequences of the traumatic event. So for example, a common one that we find is that it's my, tra my fault an event, a trauma occurred. Or other beliefs related to the consequences, like I'll never be safe anywhere, I can never trust anyone again, or I'm broken in some way. In terms of how we think this is important in terms of PTSD treatment, as I mentioned, we would expect exposure-based interventions to target avoidance, where our kind of more cognitive approaches impact more cognition and mood PTSD symptoms. So we tested this in a randomized control trial of two different trauma-focused interventions for PTSD. We examined this among written exposure therapy. This is a newer developed uh, intervention for PTSD. Uh, it's a five-session treatment it, consisting only of writing about the trauma. Uh, cognitive processing therapy is a standard 12-session outpatient treatment, and this is focused more on the beliefs related to trauma. These are standardized effect sizes, so you can interpret these as being on the same scale. We looked at the temporal sequence of change for trauma-related beliefs and some of the avoidance that we see related to trauma over time, in, separately in each intervention. So what we found in both conditions, I'm going to breeze through this as I'm running short on time, um, but I'm happy to answer questions afterwards. What we found is that avoidance changed first in both conditions and predicted subsequent change in other symptoms in both exposure-based and cognitive-based interventions for PTSD. So future directions in this area, I think there are several important ones. Um, I think this, is, this area has lacked innovation for a very long time. We don't understand how these strategies occur outside of the lab very well at all. Again, we rely on these questionnaires that I'm, we're all confident don't do a great job of measuring these constructs. So we need to develop better ways of measuring these studying changes in these over time, and hopefully getting to a more nuanced understanding of how these interact over time in a time-sensitive and context-dependent nature. Thank you to wonderful mentors and collaborators, and of course to our participants and clients and family members. Thank you all.
Dr. Lee, thank you so much for an invigorating talk, an introduction to emotion dysregulation and its relationship to trauma. We have a question for you, um, and if, it, if you anticipate it's going to take longer to answer, feel free to address it in the panel. But um, uh, the question is, are you aware or involved in VA programs to use artificial intelligence to capture and broadly study data on the methods, specifically complex interactions? of emotion regulation? I realize that that is a l large question, which may not be able to be answered in a minute. Uh, I will do the brief version of that, which is uh, no. Is, is it <coughs> <laughs> there are a lot of efforts within VA underway to use complex analytic methods, such as machine learning and others, to better identify those at risk for a, a host of different outcomes, including suicide, as well as alcohol and substance use related outcomes. As far as I know, none of those specifically target emotion regulation. Part of that is that the challenge of measuring this in a widespread manner, so as I mentioned, questionnaires are typically done. Gathering that from medical record data is infinitely more challenging. Um, and so I am not aware of anything like that underway. If someone else is, I'd, I'd be delighted to hear. Quick. Thank you very much. We are now going to